uh, her interests are in uh, uh, the doctor-patient communication and shared decision-making among uh, racial and ethnic minorities. And she's going to talk to us about uh, ethical implications of concierge medicine. Monica. Great. Yes. Thank you. glad to be here. Um, and I want to give a shout out before I start to one of our students who is with us this summer but not with us today, um, Mara Hoplamazian, and to Mark. Oh, I'm wearing a mic. Okay. I'll st it's not working. So can I stand? Okay. I'll stand here. Is this good? Great. Okay. So I just want to give a shout out to one of our students that was with us this summer and to Mark Siegler who helped us think about some of these issues. So I'm talking today about the ethics of concierge medicine and the implications that it particularly has for health disparities. So the first question is exactly what is concierge medicine? Some of us may think of Canyon Ranch, which <laughs> is delightful. Um, I've never been, but I plan to go. Uh, it also goes by several other names, retainer medicine, boutique medicine, luxury primary care, or executive health. And these are truly websites that I pulled off the internet last week um, that sort of give you a sense of the message that physicians are trying to send to potential patients and trying to attract them for their concierge practices. So this one right here, as well as this one right here. Um, um, so essentially there are issues of financing and the services that people actually get. So um, in addition, separate from regular um, medical care where people rely exclusively on health insurance if you have it, with concierge medicine there's a monthly and or annual fee ranging on average but not certainly uh, with a ceiling of $20,000 between $1,500 and $20,000 for an annual fee plus or minus um, monthly fees and for that you get a, a broader range of physician services. There are two kinds, uh, one is called direct primary care where there's cash only so if you need a test or procedure all of that is coming directly out of your pocket, insurance is not accepted at all. The majority of them, 80%, actually do accept insurance, which has, I think, more important implications for the rest of us in that the additional tests and procedures that uh, are ordered by the physicians are actually covered by insurance companies, and so we all share the burden of um, or, or pay for additional tests that are happening under the, con the auspices of concierge medicine. Um, what people get in return are essentially faster clinic visits so you can get to see the doctor faster. You have more time with the physician. Um, we a lot of times think about uh, two key areas in concierge medicine. In addition to physicians, there's a whole team-based approach to care. So they may have a nutritionist, a physical trainer, um, a variety of subspecialists that are there on the same day. So you can go and get everything done at once. And you have a lot of time. You can talk about lifestyle issues and really get in-depth counseling, which sounds great. Like, well, we all want that. The other aspect that we a lot of times think about for concierge medicine is the idea of asymptomatic screening for, for procedures. So someone who has no cardiac risk factors is not having chest pain or, dis or shortness of breath, but getting a stress test or getting uh, routine pelvic ultrasounds or screening for cervical uh, ovarian cancer, which we know right now is not considered a standard of care. So, the, uh, so in addition to having the, the, the nice array of services that we would all want, part and parcel of what we typically think about for concierge medicine is the additional access to unnecessary tests and treatment. Um, that may otherwise uh, people not have access to. Um, so you have additional, a broader, uh, faster access to your doctor, more access to your doctor as far as time spent. You have additional goods and services, and then uh, ready access as far as basically 24-7 access to your physician. In some cases, they will fly to wherever you are, be that internationally or not. Um, at the very least, 24 um, access to their cell phone, their email um, for co ongoing consultation services. And then there's sort of the, the distal end, the most extreme end, where there are amenities that we normally associate with things like Canyon Ranch, um, where there's saunas and massages and buffet lunches and plush bathrobes and things that you would ordinarily think about um, getting when you go to a high-end hotel. The difference is that this is not a high-end hotel. These are healthcare goods and services. Um, we've seen a remarkable rate of the growth of concierge services just in the past few years, both as far as time um, and in key cities like Chicago. So concierge medicine is something that really sort of draws for physicians upon the reason it's so appealing is that we get to do what all of us want to do as physicians, spend more time with patients, have a smaller number of patients that we cater to. For, for patients, I certainly would want to sign up for that. I don't think anyone loves a spa more than I do, and if I can get that and see my physician at the same time, well, that sounds like a really great idea. Here's 
here's the challenge or the problem that may seem um, obvious, but I want to explore it a little bit more over the next few minutes, and I will try and stay on time. It's the, the paradigm in which this occurs. So we know that, um, for example, oh, this is just a slide about physician salaries. Most concierge medicine is within the realm of primary care, so family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, where we typically are on the lower end of the pay scale. Um, and this is just a broad um, spectrum of the enhancement of physician salaries that are possible. So in addition to the things about having more time with patients, certainly you can make a lot more money as a physician who's in concierge medicine as opposed to standard uh, private practice or academic practice. The, the paradigm shift that we, uh, I think that um, is my sort of proposal today is where we currently are with concierge medicine is that people who have a higher social class, people who have more access to goods and services and income um, are the ones who are primarily utilizing concierge services because they're able to afford the retainer fees. We know that in general, um, death and dying and illness um, affects everyone, but it is protective if you have additional income, if you have additional access to goods and resources. This is a study that was done in England a few years ago, and basically the x-axis just shows you a lower, increasingly lower social status. So the farther you are to the right, the lower you are on the social scale, and then the y-axis um, shows you um, the expected life expectancy. Um, and so you see that the worse your social position is, position is, the lower your life expectancy is. And this is not necessarily new to us, um, but this is, um, just another way of categorizing the effects of class um, on people's actual le um, life expectancy, their mortality, their morbidity. And so within the concept of concierge medicine, what we have is essentially a population that has the most access to goods and services, the most access to, to better health, actually um, getting a disproportionate amount of healthcare goods and services. And so I would like to sort of flip that on its head. I think this um, raises a couple of key uh, questions for us, both in terms of clinical ethics, but also in terms of health disparities. So I'm going to try and to use to interweave those two paradigms for uh, having us think a little bit more about concierge medicine. So the first um, ethical issue I would say was med one of medical professionalism. And so we have sort of a uh, few key principles in that around patient welfare, autonomy, and social justice. But as we are seeing um, con increasing concerns about the erosion of medical professionalism um, in our country, what is the impact of concierge medicine um, do for our role as physicians in society. Um, if people are under the impression that we're more in it for the money, more in it for ourselves, than we are for the welfare of our patients. Certainly um, there are concerns about the influence of trainees and what that tells to future generations of physicians about what it means to be a good physician. Um, it, that means that you're primarily going to be focusing on a very small subset of patients um, who are more affluent um, as opposed to trying to care for all patients who may need your services. In 2003 and 2012, the American Medical Association and the American College of Physicians essentially came out and said, well, within our pluralistic, pluralistic society, we think that there's a, an adequate space for concierge medicine. Um, and I will then turn this over to a paper that Dr. Seeler smiling, um, that our own Lydia Dugdale, uh, Mark Seeler, and David Rubin um, published in Perspective in Biology and Medicine in 2008 thinking specifically about medical professionalism and what it means in the context of the doctor-patient relationship, they identified about six key tenets. Some of those are directly relevant to our conversation today around being a good steward of society's resources, um, having uh, support for policies that decrease health disparities, and really developing and maintaining strong and effective doctor-patient relationships. So we see that at least half of those are directly relevant or particularly challenged with the idea of how we're implementing concierge medicine within our country today. Um, and so despite the fact that the ACP um, has a more neutral position about concierge medicine, there was a paper that came out that our own Dan Salmezi was on, he's listed as a co-author, that came out um, about managed care. But because it has to do with health plans and medicine and professionalism, I'm using that um, to draw as a, an example for us to draw upon as we think about some of these issues as applied more broadly to retainer medicine, boutique medicine. This was published in 2004. So it came out in annals officially under the uh, advisory committee for American College of Physicians, but there are a number of subspecialty organizations who signed on to this and who were listed at the front of the paper as well, representing a broad swath of medical specialties, including general internal medicine, which is where um, I find my medical home. One of the, there, there are many things in this paper, but one of the points was that clinicians should advocate just as vigorously for the needs of their most vulnerable and disadvantaged, as well as, as they do for their most articulate patients. And so this really gets to the heart of health disparities. The Institute of Medicine in 2001 um, 
showed us by culminating all the literature that we see that there are differences not just in health and health outcomes, but in the kind of care that's delivered by race and ethnicity. So within our country, certainly within other countries too, but within the United States, healthcare is not equally distributed. Um, and that is a con uh, an ongoing cause and um, contributor to the disparities that we see in health outcomes. So in addition to thinking about some of the potential erosion of medical professionalism and some of the key components of medical professionalism that are relevant to uh, our conversation today, there are a few that are highlighted. So again, the mention of the just and fair allocation of health resources. So uh, that paper referenced that clinicians have a responsibility to, to practice effective and efficient health care and to use health care resources responsibly. And again, um, Dr. Siegler and, and colleagues noted that in their paper as well. So again, sort of coming back to this, the picture of reminding us who is actually um, receiving concierge medicine and what that means as far as their overall life expectancy, as far as their ability to um, buffet some of the disease and morbidity and mortality um, based on their access to goods and services. Um, the, the paradigm that we have where a small population of relatively well um, healthy people are getting disproportionate amounts of goods and services is not one that is just or a, sort of a, an efficient use of our limited healthcare resources and dollars. This comes, uh, so this uh, draws upon the part of this model from the Institute of Medicine that attributes the, some of the disparities we see to what we call the ecology of healthcare systems and environmental factors, basically structural inequities that we see within our healthcare system and how those structural inequities contribute to healthcare disparities. So I want to talk a little bit more just about that. Um, so Norman Daniels in his distributive theory of justice as applied to healthcare um, really gives us a sense of how we can think about resource allocation as a contributor to health, um, particularly as related to healthcare. And so we see the potential for exacerbations of structural inequality that we've already documented, but the exacerbation of that structural inequality with the, with the um, emergence and sort of explosion of concierge medicine within this country. So if you think about the physician workforce as a goods and services, so we already know that right now, um, or let's say last year, uh, we already had a primary care physician shortage. So we have too few primary care physicians. It's primary care physicians that make up the very, the, the probably 90% of concierge practices. With the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, we have millions of people who are now coming into the medical system that we didn't have before. And so that puts additional pressures on our system for primary care physicians. And if we're seeing sort of a mass exodus from primary care in the wake of current existing and increasing need for those very services, then I think that that's, um, Sure, that makes a strong case for the exacerbation of some of the structural inequalities. I would say the same thing for not just the physicians themselves, but the goods and services that we provide. We know that there is a limited health care pie, um, and that we, so as part of how we conceptualize concierge medicine is that there is some extra ordering um, and implementation of unnecessary tests and procedures that are paid for by insurance that we all contribute to. So um, we're all, as society, disproportionately um, funneling resources resources um, that may be inappropriate and may not be evidence-based. And so as we're having, what we see with the uh, Affordable Care Act is in addition to expanding access, they're trying to do that um, by um, implementing efforts at cost containment. And so the question is, will that disproportionate burden of cost containment be borne by those who are least able to actually afford that from a health perspective? The third key ethical issue is about the patient-physician relationship itself. Um, as far as issues of continuity of care, we have research that shows that the more continuity a person has with their provider, the better their health. Patients are inherently, by definition, some of those patients are going to be left behind when a physician goes from their regular practice into a concierge practice. Usually they reduce their patient load by at least 50%. Those who are left behind are those who can't afford to pay the retainer fee. And so those are more likely to be people who have fewer resources, who are low income, racial ethnic minorities, um, who may um, be disproportionately burdened by the lack of continuity of care as far as their health outcomes and subsequent health disparities. Same thing for provider trust. We know that trust is the mediator between physician recommendation and treatment adherence, and that minorities disproportionately experience a trust or disproportionately have higher mistrust of their healthcare provider and healthcare team. And so if we are um, breaking, sort of forcibly breaking relationships that may have existed for decades by um, transitioning people out of their primary care um, and their physicians move on to a retainer practice, then we have um, several mechanisms in play by which we can anticipate 
anticipate seeing an exacerbation of health disparities. Um, two others are with cultural competency um, and shared decision making, which is actually where I spend a lot of my time sort of thinking about. All of these things are related to health care and health outcomes. And so within the context of uh, retainer or concierge medicine, there are issues that are at play that can have a direct impact on health disparities. And last, I would say, is this physician practice variation. So not sort of this is a Dartmouth map of geographic um, variation, but really thinking about the individual variation within a, a single physician practice. Um, and so this gets more to the, the model um, that looks at discrimination, bias, stereotyping, mainly unconscious bias by physicians um, when we're providing care to a broad swath of uh, patients. And so the question is, will our unconscious biases that we all have all of us as physicians, as people have these, will they get exacerbated by the conflation of who deserves care versus who can actually afford their care and what that means for um, future generations of physicians. Um, so in conclusion, I would say that our current practice of concierge medicine um, creates a number of ethical dilemmas for our profession um, and for us individually as physicians, and it has the potential to exacerbate existing health disparities that we know currently exist, um, and that what we really need is a paradigm shift so that we're risk stratifying for resource allocation based on health need. So the ones that are sickest among us, the ones that are the most vulnerable, the oldest, minorities who may have disproportionate um, inadequate access to care, those are the ones that we actually are funneling additional resources to. Um, and that actually is in line with current health policy trends as we're thinking about global uh, payments, bundled payments, population health management. So I would just suggest not that concierge medicine in and of itself is inherently evil, um, but that we rethink um, how we're um, reallocating the, the limited health care dollars that we have to ameliorate the health of the most vulnerable amongst us and to improve population health in general. I'd like to uh, say thank you and to acknowledge the various homes, um, these are only some of these, in which I sit here at the University of Chicago. Finished early enough, we have time for one or two questions. So, yes, please. Hi, Monica. Hey. Thank you so much. I'm Ma only serve from the Department of Surgery at uh, University of Chicago. Um, I wanted to thank you for that talk and then also, so where I trained in residency, um, uh, this sort of reminds me of the concierge floor sort of where many, uh, many hospitals, not actually the University of Chicago, but many hospitals have sort of a private floor where you can get the sort of hotel-like treatment and, you know, we used to joke that that floor was near a hospital um, because it actually was, from the trainee's point of view, the worst place to be. Um, you often didn't have nurses that were specialized for the operations you had had, and it was kind of like the big joke that the people with the most access were getting access to what they thought was like the best care, um, and what they were actually receiving was the opposite. Um, and certainly as physicians, we know that when we become patients, we're sometimes, we sometimes get a VIP treatment, and that can uh, lead to increased intervention. So do we have evidence that concierge medicine is really leading to better outcomes for these patients? It seems like it might be on the spectrum where it might actually lead to the opposite. Yeah, that's a good question, and there isn't a lot of literature on that, um, partially because it's, it's off the grid. So for some of the practices, it's cash only. We can't track them with insurance purposes. Um, some of the studies that have looked at, for example, uh, reduced hospitalization rates weren't really fair studies um, because they, they weren't looking at people who um, were otherwise similar for socio-demographics. And we know, again, that if you have a lot of money um, and a lot of access to goods and resources, then your social position is already inherently different. So you can't compare those to just regular people in Medicare. And so the comparison groups aren't equal. So it's hard to say that, um, just like we used to think HRT was a great thing, we have totally realized that actually women who were taking hormone replacement therapy were just healthier women. And it's not that it was the actual pill themselves. So people who right. are going into concierge medicine are healthier at baseline, and so we don't really have a whole lot of comparative studies that can look at outcomes in a way that has equal comparison groups. Thank you. One, uh, just one more question, I guess, uh, uh, Dan, please. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic, but just to pick, on, pick up on the, the last question, I mean, the, the, the whole notion that more medicine is necessarily better medicine, right. uh, I mean, treating it like a commodity that, you know, the, the more you get of it, the, the better you'll, you'll do is an obvious fallacy, right? And because we know that more diagnostic testing results in more false positives. Um, and, and so, and so I, I see this as sort 
sort of the one of the dangers of being wealthy, you know, is, is getting really um, excessive medical care that can actually hurt people. Absolutely. So I didn't sort of have time to comment on that, but you're exactly right. The incidental illness, sort of the, we do the whole body CT scan and, oh, we find these things and they're probably just benign, but now we have to go biopsy them and, oops, you bled too much and you had a reaction to the anesthesia and, oh, gosh, I really hate that. You know, and so uh, <laughs> there are unintended negative consequences from, not in addition to cost consequences of doing too much, certainly. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.